Good evening and welcome to the Chrissy B Show. Well, today we're going to be speaking about the other victims of addiction. Now, people take drugs for different reasons. For some, it's curiosity or a bit of a laugh. For others, it's a temporarily feel good because they're going through certain problems. And for others, it's simply because of peer pressure. But with so much publicity about the dangers of drug taking, why do people still go and experiment? And tonight in particular, we're going to be looking at the effect not only on the person taking the drugs, but also their family members, because the effects can be really devastating. Joining me tonight on the show will be Elizabeth Burton Phillips, a mother who tragically lost one of her twin sons to drugs. And we'll also be speaking to Mandy Saligari, addiction counsellor and founder of Charter Daycare. Later on in the show, we'll also be joined by Chris Brown for our regular self-development tips. And also, we'll be taking a look at our regular um, Good Cause feature tonight. So if you want to get in touch at any point during the show to share your views, or if you want to ask a question, you can tweet Chrissy B Show or Facebook The Chrissy B Show. And you can also call 020-7686-6300 or visit our website, chrissybshow.tv. So first, let's speak to our first guest, Elizabeth Burton Phillips. Thanks so much for joining us, Elizabeth. Thank you. Thank you very much for inviting me. Okay, so can you tell us first of all um, how family life was for you before, before the tragedy? Very ordinary, um, very, very fun, a lot of fun. Um, the joy of having identical twins mm -hmm. um, was, was massive because um, until I actually gave birth, I didn't know that I was having twins. Aww. So I was one of those mums who attended the antenatal clinics. Didn't have a bigger belly or With any? a big bump, getting bigger and bigger. Uh -huh. And I remember a very close friend of mine saying to me, a few days before I'd given birth that she hadn't got the courage to tell me I was ginormous. <laughs> and afterwards, when I rang her and said I had two babies, she mm -hmm. said, now I can tell you, you were ginormous. I understand why, you were, <laughs> why you were so big. So um, life, was, life was fun. Mm -hmm. um, were you a close family, close-knit family? I think, I think we were in those early days. I think we were very close-knit because, um, you know, having three small children and, and the joy of, of being a mum and the excitement of the future and what the future holds for you mm -hmm. as a family was uh, was a great a great time and I look back on it um, with a great deal of warmth and mm -hmm. um, remember little special little occasions you know going to visit Father Christmas and hiding the presents and parties and I remember in particular I think it was the year that Princess Diana got married, that we had a street party and our children were quite young then and got really fond memories, all the fun yeah. and games that went on in our, in our lives. Okay. So it was, it was lovely. When did you suspect something was wrong, something was happening with your sons? Um, not for a, a long, long time really, because although they picked up um, cigarettes, which was their first gateway into, into drugs at an early age of about 13 or 14, 13, that young. 13 mm. or 14. Um, and let me say that they didn't get up and say, I'm going to go and buy a packet of cigarettes and smoke myself silly. I think it was just a little bit, as you've said on the introduction, a little bit of a giggle, a mm. bit of a laugh with youngsters. You We've know. all done it, haven't we? Yes, so and I've seen, point. as a school teacher, a retired school teacher, I've seen youngsters um, smoking outside schools and that yeah. kind of thing. Mm -hmm. You know, 15 of them sharing a cigarette and that kind of thing. And I think they started in that way with absolutely no malicious intent to upset the family or do any harm. I think it was just a little bit of a, a, a bit of a giggle and mm -hmm. but very soon found themselves getting caught up in um, trying other drugs and, and developing that kind of recreational lifestyle that goes, goes with them. Um, Could you see a change in, in the behaviour at home or anything? Or? Not at all at first. It was well hidden. Um, mm. I think that was something that all the, the, the boys learned with their friends that because they're treading a line, a fine line really, of, of doing something seriously dodgy, that it was important to keep it hidden from mum mm. and dad and their family members as, as, as long as they could do. And um, because we as a family, uh, and I know many families are, are like this out there, you're not thinking you know, that your children are doing drugs. It's not actually in your mental agenda of your lifestyle. Of course not, because especially if you've done everything in your power to protect them, Indeed. to teach them, you know, the right ways and everything, mm -hmm. but it does still happen. Yeah. And I know, like, there's parents that say, but I've brought them up so well, yes. I've taught them yes. about the dangers of the world, why on yes. earth would they, would they go and 
take drugs or, mm -hmm. you know, go and steal, or anything, things like that. You don't expect that to happen. That's right. I think I sort of, um, one of the things I've learned actually from doing a lot of speaking, certainly within the, the, the prisons um, that my colleague and I um, go to, is that um, curiosity and sort of um, recklessness and, and a, a lack of real understanding of the ripple effect and the impact mm -hmm. that it can have on everybody around you is part of um, something, a, a, a real problem that needs to be addressed. How do you communicate with young people, particularly those in their early teens, that if you go down this route, it can have such devastating consequences mm -hmm. on so many people around you, family and friends. Tell us about what happened with Nick then. Well, um, sadly, the, the boys, um, Nick in particular, uh, his um, he became addicted to heroin, having been offered um, a heroin spliff. And I, as a mother, didn't even know you could smoke heroin mm -hmm. in, a, in a joint, but he was offered a heroin spliff. In actual fact, although my son was um, his own person, he made those choices, um, he was also groomed into... Um, that particular drug by a drug dealer who had they're very, a different they're very agenda. Smart, these drug dealers. Yes, they know exactly right. how to yes. make it sound like it's always oh, everything's going to be fine. Yes, you know, you won't get addicted. It's just a bit of fun. That's right. They're very manipulative. Yeah. Yes, and and sort of courted his friendship and um, mm. offered him uh, heroin spliff just as a try, but he didn't realise that he was going to step from. What, what you could describe as just an ordinary world, which was um, n not good in the sense that he was experimenting with drugs, but he was going to move very quickly to a position of addiction. Mm -hmm. And he would move from... How, how quick was it? Very, very quickly, from mm -hmm. the point of uh, within weeks he had moved from smoking um, heroin to chasing the dragon to injecting... Just weeks? Within weeks. The craving within him and the desire for the drug ruled his every waking moment mm -hmm. and that there was an addicted person in his in his head an addicted personality in his head that grabbed him by the throat and and you know just was there with him 24/7 and it was very very sad to see the sort of physical emotional psychological demise of him. Um, How did that affect you all at home? What was going on indoors? Well, um, my experience is, and I think any family member who is watching this, is that when you have an addict in the family, it becomes a family illness and mm -hmm. everybody is caught up in it because um, that some people will, some members of the family will have their own view on how you should deal with it. Some are saying, kick them out. Some are saying, mm -hmm. put them in rehab. Some are saying, don't ever speak to them again. And, and so everybody is caught up in this family illness, which creates um, huge unhappiness and arguments uh, and, and um, a real dilemma um, for, for the family members who then find themselves very easily locked into cycle of addiction and mm. trapped emotionally often. Did you feel helpless, like you couldn't do anything? Very you? helpless, really. And because of my position as a school teacher in a very lovely school that I'm now retired from, that I have lovely memories of, um, I was very worried about people finding out what my colleagues would say, mm. what the pupils would say, what the parents would say, what the head teacher would say. Would I get the sack? How was I going to be judged? What would mm -hmm. people think of my family? Would they think I was a bad mother? Um, so, and I know. So you don't normally think of this side of things. That's right. We we're always focus yeah. on the, the the person actually taking the drugs and yes. trying to help them, but it's the, the effects on the family are devastating. Absolutely. You, you go through so much. There's mm. also, you know, the job, everything. There's so much more to it. Yes, that's that's the whole thing. That the, the message that I would really want to get out there to any anybody who's contemplating even going down that route is, um, it's it's. In, in many ways, it's a very selfish thing to do, mm. to, to take drugs, because it harms so many other people yeah. that care about you. Mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, I, I have met grandmothers in their 80s who are out working, um, cleaning, to find money for their, mm -hmm. you know, their family members' drugs. Um, and and um, I've spoken to children who've told me 
what it's like to watch their parents, um, you know, take drugs as well and inject drugs and how mm. it's, it's breaking, tearing everybody apart yeah. in the family. And Nick actually went into rehab, didn't he? But then it, it didn't That's work right. For him. We, um, we as a family wanted so, so much, we wanted recovery so much for, for him um, that we actually put him into rehab. Mm -hmm. And actually, we learned that that's not necessarily the wisest of moods because, um, in a sense, an addict needs to desire within their own mm -hmm. heart recovery. And um, so it, we did put him in, and we had great hopes um, that we thought that this would cure him mm -hmm. to put him through um, a detox and then, um, it, you know, put him on the path to um, a great future. But it, it didn't work out like that because at the time there weren't any um, sort of coping mechanisms for him and aftercare to, to look after, after him and the family. So mm -hmm. he very quickly relapsed. Yeah. Okay, and then, then what happened? Well, he continued, um, continued using and uh, there came a point really where my husband said, you know, you... He's 26 years of age. We've watched this happen for nearly 13, 14 years. It's, it's the point, really, where you have to exercise tough love and let go. And that's mm. really tough on, on any mum and any dad to let go of their children, even though they're adult children. When you mm. see them, they're struggling. And my husband said, you know, maybe you need to make your mind up and make a choice between myself uh, and the boys. And um, that was... Uh, very difficult, very difficult decision to come to. But for me, it it was it was helped in a way to, to, to find that decision because Nicholas, um, I was trying to get him to his probation officer. He was in trouble, um, and he took out a, a needle. And while I was driving the car, he actually injected in front of me, all oh at the gosh. side of me. And I realised that his addiction was so, so out of control and it held him so much um, that there was nothing more I could do. Mm. It didn't matter how much love, how much money I poured into him. It had gone beyond that, way beyond that, and I had to, to walk away and let mm. go. And in actual fact, I, I don't regret that decision at all because he chose then to go and see a drugs worker to work with the doctor, the drugs worker, the chemist, mm -hmm. and he was put on a four-way um, program where he was given a synthetic opiate to help him s start to find recovery, reduce the cravings. Mm -hmm. And um, it was good to see that that was starting to work because I tried yeah. photographs of him mm -hmm. as he progressed through that, through that journey in the hope of... Um, finding his recovery. Mm. Mm. And how, how did, because very quick, because we're going to go to a break, how did your family cope when he did die? Well, um, it was completely devastating for all of us. And of course, you'll remember that, that day for the rest of your life. Mm -hmm. And uh, I wouldn't have predicted eight and a half years ago that I'd be sat here talking to you. Yeah. Um, but I have, I think the family have coped remarkably well. Mm -hmm. And, um, and actually, you've done something really positive out of yes, it as well, which yes. gonna, we're going to speak about after yeah. the break, because, Elizabeth, actually, you wrote a book, first of all, and then yeah. also went on to found a charity that actually helps families cope. Yeah. And, you know, you give advice and, and support. support to yes. families that That's are right. going through this as well. So even though something terrible happened, yes. but you, you are now helping other people through it, which I think is fantastic. Yes, and, really, and it, really helps great. You. it helps yeah. you as well. Yeah. Okay, so we're going to be speaking to you more after the okay. break, Elizabeth, and we're also going to be joined by Mandy Saligari, an addiction counsellor, who will be helping us understand why addiction is such a growing problem worldwide. So join us after this break. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show, where tonight we're speaking about the other victims of drug addiction. That's, of course, the family members who often go through hell because of this. Joining us now, we have addiction counsellor Mandy Saligaro, who's going to be telling us about how we can 
try our best to help family members or friends and how to recognise some of the signs and symptoms as well. Good evening and welcome to the show, Mandy. Hello, thank you. So you've, you've heard Elizabeth's story. It's very moving, I know. Yes, so. I did. I was listening to you. I just wanted to say that that is sadly a familiar story, but sure. nonetheless intensely moving to bear witness to, even sitting in a studio such as mm. this, wherever you hear it, wherever you hear a story like that, thank you moved. Mm -hmm. And I think it's uh, really important that you bring that. Thank you. Actually, so I think I mean it's you. great that obviously you are here talking about it yes. because even if we just help one family that's right. or one teenager that's thinking I'm gonna I'm, I want to experiment. It's just friends, you know. I'm just out with my friends. I'm that's just right. having a little smoke. I'm just gonna have just try this pill, you know. Mm -hmm. Please, you've seen the effects. You've seen how devastating it can be for family. Don't, don't, don't just think of yourself and looking good in front of people. Think of your family members as well who really love you and really care for you. So, very important right. message. Yeah. So, Mandy, tell us, how can we recognise the signs? Of However, I would say to you I'm a little bit more ambitious than that. And I know you're okay. supposed to say, if I help one person, then that's great. Well, more, but actually, more the, better. <laughs> the more the better. And yeah. I think that, um, you know, it's an intensely difficult thing to be able to say no to something like drugs. Uh, out there. It's humiliating in the face of uh, a bunch of people who are there uh, experimenting with something to say no puts you out in the cold as uncool, untrustworthy, out of the scene. I mean, and we're talking about the emotional process really mm -hmm. here. Um, I heard you talking about drug dealers and their ability to be very manipulative. Yeah. The way I look at this condition um, is that it is, it is an illness. It's much bigger than the manifestations of it, the drugs, the alcohol, the eating disorders, the work, the gambling, the self-harming. There are 14 mm. different addictions uh, that are treated and considered to be addictions worldwide. Mm -hmm. um, and they have around 10 core characteristics. And you're looking at abstinence or, um, if you like, harm reduction as one aspect of looking at this illness don't smoke the drug uh, or be abstinent, whichever way around you look at it. Mm -hmm. But actually the illness exists usually way before that. And I belong to uh, a group of thinkers in this uh, industry who would recognize an addict as young as six, seven, eight, way you, before you, the drugs you, or alcohol that one? kick in. Is it like okay. so, so, you've got certain emotional characteristics maybe, or you're easily led? What, what yeah, do you mean? well, what this is, uh, it's kind of like if I could tell you very, very clearly black and white what it is and you had a checkbox, I'm sure mm. everybody would be dashing off doing the checkbox <laughs> and residing on the side of I'm yeah. close to the edge of being an addict, but I'm not. There are four core causes, if you like, uh, or contributory factors to addiction and they can happen in any quantity, if mm. you like, but there are four key areas. One is a family predisposition, the family illness. Yeah. There's no such thing as an addiction gene I don't know of anyway yet but it travels through families like a musical ability or a theatrical bent. Mm -hmm. It's that kind of culture that exists in the families. Then you have the shape of the brain, the neurology, uh, evidence coming through from the States around self-regulation of affect and behavior. So the child that is the sensitive child, the child who feels excitement in extreme ways and if you like depression, the other end of the scale in extreme mm -hmm. ways. So they're the child that gets really, really excited and then goes off the scale or becomes very sad and uh, isn't able to contain themselves. The other children can get excited and contain themselves, but these children can't mm -hmm. because the part of the brain that's responsible for affect and behavioral regulation is not as well developed mm -hmm. and it's an invisible symptom. Then you have traumatic event. Now, again, you have your sensitive child experiencing traumatic event. Mm -hmm. And I'm talking about, if you like, not your big traumatic events, such as a murder or a hostage mm. taking or something mm. like that. I'm talking about divorces and arguments in the family and family disturbance. The sensitive child experiences that in a different way to the child who hasn't got those sensitivities, that predisposition. So the family will say, I've brought my children up exactly the same. How come this child is the addict and mm. these ones are perfectly all right? It mm. can't be my parenting. And I will say to them, only one and the fourth factor is the family environment. It is nature and nurture. It's the age old argument. The environment has a massive part to play, but certainly in the last 15 years, with the advent of the internet and so forth, yes. that environment 
is a worldwide culture. Yeah. It's peer pressure. Mm. It's 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 the culture. It's no longer simply the family environment, mm. which mm -hmm. traditionally we would say. Yeah. So we have these four components, all in kind of different quantities that can mm -hmm. uh, uh, pre bring about an addictive personality. Elizabeth, or... did you notice anything like that in? In Nicholas when he was young, was he like, sensitive or anything like that? No, not at all. I mean, mm. um, I, I didn't, looking back now, I, I can't sort of pinpoint anything that, mm -hmm. uh, that sibling rivalry, yes, um, you know, between him and his, his brother and sister, but uh, I wouldn't, wouldn't have noticed anything mm -hmm. that I could say. Um, you know, was absolutely, I could pinpoint. Well, it's, good, it's good to know that because if you do have young children and you see these things, because maybe you wouldn't think now, but maybe a parent watching now and hear yes. these four, four things, they can maybe pick up on something. But is there something that a parent or yeah. a friend can do from, at that stage that say, okay, now okay, I've seen this tendency in my child, what can I do now to help them not, or pr try to prevent them not, from not taking drugs later on? Well, I can be even more specific, actually. I can talk about the parenting for prevention because it's a model that I'm developing and I promote and talk in schools about and have done for several years now. Mm -hmm. So I can absolutely talk about that, but I can tell you that there are more specific things that you can pick up on in that child. The amount of parents that I have sat with over the last 15, 20 years that I've been working in this field that say, but she's got so much going for her. She, you've heard this, yeah? <laughs> yes. She's got so much going for her. She's so clever. She's got so much potential. Yeah. Yeah. And the parents sitting here, the child's doing this. Oh. Mm. You know, so and it, yeah. there is this um, often brilliance. Some of the addicts that I've met are some of the most brilliant people mm. that I have ever met. You're talking about people who have a very sharp and quick, quick grasp on concepts. You're talking about often very brilliant people who have a sort of insecurity, uh, perhaps a lack of self-esteem that allows that potential to, there's, there's sort of no mast of self on which to yes. pin the, the, the assets of character, if mm -hmm. you like. So there's this absence and maybe they're too fast moving, but they are the child who will be surrounded by friends and come home and say, I haven't got any friends. Mm -hmm. And the parents are going, what? Mm -hmm. You know, you, you're very popular. <laughs> and there is this dis disparity between yeah. what you believe about your child or mm -hmm. the person that you know and what they're telling you. When you start hearing that, you're hearing someone who says, um, if only you knew because the addict is isolated in a crowd. Mm -hmm. The addict can give a good performance, they can be confident, oh, yes, but yes, they can yes, have low self-esteem. Yes, yes. And so these how, are very how different things. To say like, okay, so how now, helps now, someone? Now, you know, we have, it's not a child anymore, now it's a teenager already yeah. taking drugs. Or yeah. How can we recognize and how can we help that person? Okay, so first, addiction looks very like normal teenage behavior. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> as you listen to all of this, oh. the first thing I want to say is if you're a parent listening to this, is to stop, to hear it, take it in and do nothing for at least a week because there will be a knee-jerk reaction. And if you throw a knee-jerk reaction at a teen, they'll throw a massive, massive <laughs> yeah. kung fu knee-jerk reaction. Yeah. You yeah. know, so, so yeah. really don't do the knee-jerk reaction. But if this stuff's ringing bells, then uh, what we suggest to someone is by the time they get to a teen, you're already out of your league because they are one powerful, well-connected, internet, mobile connected, two peers and culture better than you. Mm -hmm. So what you need is you need people on your side, you need a strategy. So yeah. I would recommend if you see that these things are going on, you go to places like Drug Fund, which is your charity, yeah. you go to some of the uh, support groups that are out there, you contact an addiction specialist, not a generic counsellor. Mm -hmm. It's got to be an addiction specialist. specialist. Right. Yes. And an addict will run rings round, mm -hmm. with all respect. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's, just take, a, let's yeah. take a question from what is often from the public. Hi, Chris. Yes, we have a question here for Elizabeth and Mandy. Someone wants to know, my older sister keeps partying every night. She's so moody the next day, and she shouts and cries all the time. I think she's taking regular class A's. She snaps whenever I ask if she's okay, and so I feel helpless and hurt. How can I help her? So ladies, what's your advice for this person? Would you like to go first? No, I'd love to. I, I, um, <laughs> thank you. I, I hear this and I think, I know if you go to an addict and say, I'm worried about the drugs you're taking, they go, because this is what they're taking, and they will cry. So that's the first thing is things they're that going you to want protect to do. their yes. drug of choice. Yeah. Yeah. And they will often cry and say, oh, I know, I made a real mess, I'm so mm. sorry. Make all the apologies and mentally they're thinking, mustn't 
uh, take drugs in front of you again. Oh my gosh, really? Without a doubt, because the primary focus, once the drugs are on board, is to protect the resource at all costs, because there isn't anything else. The mm. concept of having a life without drugs is out of the question. Mm. So what you need to be doing is approaching first, you need to have a sense of self if you're going to confront your addict or you're concerned about someone, back to the strategy, get someone on board, get a sense of self on board, get a sense of self-respect on board and stop trying to control the outcome. Then visit that person that you care about and say to them, you know, I'm worried about you. You talk about how you feel okay. rather than what's happening to them because they mm -hmm. can't argue with mm. that. Right. They cannot okay. argue with that. Well, I would pick up on that and say if this is uh, something, I don't know if it's a young person asking you about their sister, but certainly if it's a parent um, or an older family mm -hmm. member, the most important thing that they can do is to seek support for themselves yep. right. within the framework of a group that can offer that. Can you that quickly kind tell us support. about Drug Fam? Yes, yes, Drug Fam was set up in, in memory of Nicholas in, back in 2006, and uh, what we do is we offer um, weekly support groups. We have support groups in High Wycombe, in Slough, in Swallowfield, and just a new one opening in Chesham in Buckinghamshire, mm -hmm. um, so that family members can, can go there and really offload mm -hmm. the, the problems that they have, which can be anything from, you know, a daughter taking cocaine to a son on, on heroin or using ketamine or all manner of drink and drugs. Um, and we, we um, slowly um, enable these people to, these family members to understand that they actually don't need to be trapped in, in the cycle of addiction, that they have a choice about mm -hmm. what is happening in their life and that they can set boundaries and break free from being codependent right. and, and constantly giving money and, and accepting behaviour that's really unacceptable. Okay, and obviously all, all the details of our guests tonight will be on the website as well, chrissybishow.tv. Let's take another one more question from Mati before we finish. Yes, one more person is asking, Cannabis is sometimes legal when people are in physical pain. Does this then mean if I'm feeling sad or having sleep problems and take cannabis that I'm a druggie and should be labelled? If it's legal to solve problems in certain situations, why is it judged in other situations? A fair question. That is a very interesting, very interesting question. Um, what I would say is that, um, you know, if any, any drug that can help a person who's in great pain and suffering, mm -hmm. we would all, all go with that uh, as, as some form of care or help that, as long as it's medically prescribed. But my experience is that um, young people in particular who perhaps try cannabis or today's skunk is that um, they don't realise that it can actually severely mess with their brain, mm -hmm. that suddenly it starts to control them, that they will possibly experience um, psychosis and paranoia and the young people's brains are still forming yeah. and therefore I think you know it's it's all about really understanding that if they choose to go that route mm -hmm. there are consequences okay. which may affect them considerably. Mandy, um, now if someone's watching now that's yeah. contemplating taking drugs, starting to take drugs because of peer pressure or whatever or you know, what, what would you advise them? What would you say okay. to them? What I would say is that the most dangerous uh, relationship is between your emotions and the drug. If you take a drug to relieve your feelings or to cope with how you feel, what happens is that I take the drug, the drug takes a drug, and then the drug takes me. Mm -hmm. I need to be able to develop coping mechanisms, emotional coping mechanisms. Um, and that's absolutely the work that you can do, whether it's through charitable groups, through a uh, private resource such as the one that I have in, mm. in Harley Street, which, by the way, it may, and I would always say this as well, approach a counsellor, because even though we are private and we are in what might be perceived to be an expensive site, all of us have low-cost services, because that's most really people good to know. who yeah, work yeah, in this industry yeah. are there vocationally. There right. is usually something that pushes people into this kind of work mm. above and beyond the call of duty. So uh, the support is there. 
Right. It's just a case of picking up the phone and asking the question. And if the person doesn't want, doesn't recognise they need help, can the family member do that as well and come to you for, for the help? The family members, when the family member comes, they, well, lots of family members think the addict's the one who's got to get into treatment. Absolutely not. If you sweep up the enablement mm -hmm. and you get the family here yes, yes. and you get the family on board yeah. and healthy and respectful and united yeah. and actually back in their own bodies instead of trying to hold this affected other person taken hostage Mm -hmm. by this illness, then the addict is left exposed with only their resources and that's a really good wake-up call for mm -hmm. them. Yes. And the family can feel confident that they're contributing to the solution, not the problem. So whatever right. happens, they can put their head on their pillow at night and say, I have done everything that I could in my conscience today okay. and that's all I can do. Mm -hmm. All right, that's great. Ladies, unfortunately, we've run out of time. Thank you. But we could do another Happy hour yes. on, on this Thank subject, you. so maybe we'll have to do another show on it <laughs> shortly. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so if you do need any help, please, please, Please do visit their websites as well. All the details will be on the website, chrissybshow.tv. So after the break, I'm going to be joined by Chris Brown, who's going to be sharing his self-development tips. And also we're going to be featuring a good course. So join us after this. Welcome back to the Chrissy B Show. Well, I was really, really touched by Elizabeth's story and she didn't actually have time to speak about a play that's going to be out in October called Mum, Can You Lend Me 20 Quid? So I will be putting those details up on the website, chrissybshow.tv. And just something to bear in mind, a person that offers you a free smoke or pill is not your friend, no matter how they might seem friendly and really try to persuade you, they're not your friend. And actually, you could be looking at a future potential murderer. Because that's what it's that's what that's what it boils down to at the end of the day. And you sometimes think it's never going to happen to me. I'll never get that much into it. But as you heard, it within a matter of weeks, Nicholas went from just having a smoke to actually injecting drugs. So please, please do keep your eyes open and be safe. All right. So before we speak to Chris Brown, we're actually going to show you our cause of the week, and this is Teens United. So take a look at this lovely charity. Okay, so I'm here with Debbie and Karen, founders of Teens Unite. Can you tell us how the, the charity was founded, Debbie? The charity was founded in 2007, um, just from myself and Karen doing quite a bit of research on that age group. And um, the age group we decided to help is 13 to, to 24. And we really decided to set up the charity to give people fun. We're about fun and looking past your illness. I was diagnosed with uh, Hodgkin's lymphoma, which is um, a blood type of cancer, when I was 19. And um, after diagnosis, I then spent several years on the journey going through the various treatments trying to get rid of it. Um, at some, I did have a, uh, at some stage, it was quite a bumpy ride. I was told I was terminally ill at one point. But um, luckily, I've been through that and I've been fine for nearly four years now. So, How have you kept yourself positive? Um, well, firstly, coming here every day has um, helped me a lot, it's seeing the animals, seeing the people here. And that's um, founded by Debbie Pisani and Karen Millen. They're lovely people, I don't know where I'd be without them. And they've brought so much happiness to so many other people's lives as well. It's great when we actually get young people involved because it's a, a charity that's very much based about young people and they understand what it is that that age group actually wants. So, you know, that's it's really encouraging. So we go out to some of the universities or schools and speak to them and find that they're really interested to, to help. So we're joined as well by Steve, who's the director of the Paradise Wildlife Park and also trustee of Teens Unite. So thanks for joining us, Steve. So tell us, how did, how did um, you guys get to work together then? Um, Debbie used to come with her daughters to Paradise Wildlife Park as they were growing up and as a consequence of that they used to come very regularly and um, we got to know each other and became friends. You know and I know a lot of people that have been affected by cancer and have lost children's cancer so being able to do something positive is, is really quite special. But some people have really wanted to do certain things like we had a young girl who sadly isn't with us anymore but her in her very far last few weeks wanted to hold snakes do you remember mm. and lizards and it was a thing she'd got that she felt that she was going to miss out in her life if she hadn't achieved that so I guess it was for a dream for her then her yeah. wish list yeah she'd made a wish list of certain things she wanted to do and that was one of them we find that animals are really inspirational to young people you get a lot of comfort and a lot of I was just saying before that even my cat that I have at home Nina she really distresses me sometimes just look at her cute face and I just you know forget all the worries 
Yeah, I agree. And, and we have that with many of our teenagers that like dogs and, and, and brings joy to the home. Now, Karen, I know you have dogs yourself, so you can understand like, the therapeutic side of things as well. Yeah, absolutely. I think they give you so much joy. I mean, I've got two, yeah, two dogs and um, there's just something quite special about um, the connection between you. They, they have this um, sense of what you're feeling um, and I think it's just so comforting. Um, you know, they, they can sense when you're feeling down or, you know, you fear something. Um, so, yeah, I think uh, there's a, definitely a special connection with, with animals. I think it's great that you know you're off offering that to the to the teenagers that come here as well. It's really wonderful. And if you do want to support this charity, the, the details are on the bottom of your screen now. Okay, so that's Teens Unite, a really, really worthy cause if you want to support it. Okay, so now we have Chris Brown and please do get a piece of paper and a pen because what he's going to be teaching us is very, very useful. Hey, it's Isn't it, Chris? Very useful, Chrissy. You? I'm great, thanks. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank yeah? you. I'm excited to see what you're going to teach us today. Ah, well, what I'm going to teach, funny you use the word teach because we're actually talking about learning. It's mm -hmm. about learning to learn. And it's going back on how we actually learn because as a child, we grow up and we learn. Mm -hmm. That's our thing we want to do and we just grasp information. Talking about from, let's say, preschool, right in. Mm -hmm. Then after a while, we start to develop a style of what we're used to learning and a certain way of learning. Mm -hmm. And what I'm gonna explain is these three ways of learning styles. The first one we're talking about is VAC. Now VAC is abbreviation. We're talking about V. V mm -hmm. means for visual learning. Now there are certain people who learn visually, right? Mm -hmm. Then we've got the A, which is auditory, which is more of listening, right? Yeah. Okay, and then we've got the K, which is kinesthetic, which is more touchy-feely learning. Mm -hmm. Now, in saying that, different people learn in different ways. So, could you imagine this? You've got a class, and you've got a class of, let's say, 10 children. Mm -hmm. You've got 10 children in a class. And I'm sure someone can actually talk about when they've actually experienced as a child. You've got 10 children in a class. Four of them are visual learners. So, they're more um, see and read people. Right. right. And then you've got another four, which are, let's say, auditory. Right. So, they're more speak and listen. Mm -hmm. But then you've got two which might be kinesthetic and you might be the one when you were the child who was a kinesthetic child who's more touchy-feely, you need to um, be shown how to actually do something instead, more, um, as my wife would put it, experimental instead, right? Mm -hmm. So, right, you need to be shown how to do it, so you've got the two of you. Then what happens is the teacher at the class is teaching them on a screen or, let's say, on a board, and they're explaining things. So for the child that, say, has the more visual side, they'll pick it up pretty quick. Mm -hmm. That's their learning style. The child with auditory start listening to it will pick it up. The person the other one would. <laughs> wouldn't really yeah. pick it up, right? Aww. So you think about it. Now they get their results at the end, and they seem like an underachiever. They didn't do well. They didn't feel they do well. Well, let me tell you this at home now wrong. You probably did do well, but Gosh, you just didn't know your so style. Know. It's very yeah. interesting because mm -hmm. there's a lot of people who have been labelled in certain ways, but obviously time has moved on. We found out different teaching style, different learning styles. Mm -hmm. Now, when you said get a pen and paper, this is the reason why, because what we're going to do is going to find out what your learning style is and see how you can improve oh, yourself okay. into more learn and learn, right? Yes. So I'm going to break that down again. I'm going to go right. back over them. So I want you to write down the V, which is visual. V is for visual. Visual. Now these mm -hmm. people are more read and see. See and read people. Mm -hmm. Okay, we got that down. Now we got the A, which is auditory. These people are more listeners and speakers. And then we've got the last one, I hope I haven't gone too fast here. No, that's fine. Which is kinesthetic. How do you spell that? Well, <laughs> this is really funny, right? Because that's what I was going to say. Do you know where the word Kines came from, kinesthetic? It's an old... It's a Greek word. There you go. Because like, it's, it's to do with movement. No, it's not. Is it to do no, with you want to write Oh, track. movement, yeah. There you are. Yes, not, yes, yeah. kinesthetic. So, yeah. kine is movement. It's old 19th century word. And you see, uh, all, all the words come from the Greek language, <laughs> kino, which means, this one when <laughs> which I means movement. Yes, movement okay, and asiatic is yeah. the side of Feel. sensation, yeah. feeling, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, so putting two together, some people okay. learn better that way. So they're more touchy-feely people. Now, think about this. 
If that's the case, then you've got to work out for yourself, which one are you? What is, what is your learning style? Reflect back to the things you do. I'll give you a, a prime example. Let's talk about practical things. I was saying to Chrissy earlier on that, let's uh, run a little fun test and say this. Okay, and ready. here goes a fun little test. And you try this at home as well, right? Now, imagine this. You've gone to that very well-known store where they do flat pack tables and uh -huh. furniture. And you get this furniture at home. Yeah. Here we go. You've got three choices. Do you open it up and read the instructions? Yes, That's I do. One. Okay, right. Or <laughs> number two, right, do you get somebody to explain to you the instructions? No. Right? Number three, do you just have a go of putting it together? Never. Never, right? So you said yours is the first one, first one right? First one, definitely, yeah. Now, think about this at home as well, right? Chrissy said that's the first one. Now you think about it, let's put it the other way around. V-A-K, that's what I actually asked you. Visual, auditory, or kinesthetic. Right, so you said you're a visual person. Mm -hmm. You probably read it, put it together, follow instructions, yeah. right? Let's try another one. Let's try okay. another one while we're at it. Okay, all right, um, let's say a recipe. That's an interesting one, recipe. Okay, you've got the recipe there. Do you actually read the recipe, put in each ingredient, right? Do you call up your friend and say, look, um, could you explain this to me, somebody who's made it already, or do you do it by taste while you go along making it? Mm. This tastes good. Hmm. Now, will it, will it really confuse matters if I said all three? <laughs> you do all three? I, with, with the recipe, yeah. But well, I do tend to follow a recipe. Right. But then I will base it on taste. And sometimes if someone has made it before, it doesn't look quite right. Is this the right way of doing right, it? So okay. probably the first one would take precedence. Well, it's funny you said it because that helps to explain what I'm about to explain. Because you just said you do all three. Mm -hmm. Now, in saying this, the three, it doesn't mean that person sticks to one only. It means that one of them is your strongest point of learning. Mm -hmm. But we're multiple people. We're made up of the three at the end of the day. We could do visual, we could do auditory, mm -hmm. and we could do kinesthetic. Okay. Now, um, I'd look at it and think, well, all right, I might have done the kinesthetic, I might have done auditory, you know? Um, I teach a lot of seminars. It's auditory. Mm -hmm. And I know that for me to transfer that information, there's a certain group out there that will pick this up in that way. Mm -hmm. There's certain group up there that if I've got a PowerPoint, they will pick this up. So I'll mix both. So they both pick it up and they both have a great experience. That's right. at the Chris Brown seminars. I'm okay. just plugging it. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay, right. they have a great experience there. <laughs> right? But think back to it. Seriously, think back to yourself. What would you have done in that situation? And if you think back to think, what would you have done in that situation? You'd probably learn out, le sorry, you'd probably pick up your learning style. Forget what happened before. Even if you start to relearn and study again, you might realize that, well, those marks that you got might not be in the marks that you should have had. Mm. Because... But how can you use that in practice today? Like, what can you do with that? Learn Now, if, say, for example, I know that I'm the first one, say, for example, how, right. can, I, how can that benefit me today? Okay, think about this. Um, let's just say your situation was that... Uh, let's give a little improvisation here. Might have been in class when you was younger, mm -hmm. and it might have been that you were kinesthetic and the probably tutor at the time, not aware of that, blanket teaching, right? And when you came at your results and they said, well, you're pretty bad underachiever, you didn't do well. And then you get the feeling of it because we're talking about feeling mm -hmm. touchy, that I am an underachiever and um, I'm not good at this subject and this subject might be numeracy, it might be maths. So you go away thinking every time you come up to that subject, I'm not gonna touch it. I wouldn't go there at all. But this is what you do with it practically today. You realize which is your perfect learning style. Mm -hmm. Now, from learning what your perfect learning style is, you'll go back and attack that and challenge it again. You'd find That's a better way of explaining it. You know, if somebody was explaining something to me that I couldn't pick up on, I'd actually ask them, could you explain it in a way that I can understand? That's really interesting. It's interesting, so first isn't First of all, you, you realize that actually you weren't that bad at school. Exactly. And that you, you just needed to learn in a different way. So, and... Actually, I think probably nowadays most people know how to teach different kind of styles. Well, that's right? the benefits of today is in the teaching. I'm actually trained, good at maths. You might be brilliant at it. I, I was really I was bad at one. economics. Oh, oh I never oh. got that. I never understood that. Oh, actually, I got. I think I got you. Right. Which my dad said was you for useless, but it was actually un unclassified. <laughs> <did that> <laughs> I didn't even get a grade in that. So maybe I should revisit economics. Well, sometimes it's worth revisiting some things that we fail at the time because of our circumstance yeah. and situation and environment. That's such a confidence booster. Thank you, Chris. Oh, oh great. Glad you like it. Yeah. yeah I hope that them really at home good. actually making some use of this and actually put in practice and let you know so about first, it. So first, know which category you fall into. That's right. And then that can be your learning. So that's really interesting. Yeah.
Thank That's you it. so much, Chris. Brilliant. Thank you, you, you very much. You can join us again next week. I will do. I like these little tests. You should have more of them. Yeah. yeah? <laughs> That's great. <laughs> All right, then. So we have reached the end of our program for today. But do join us again on Friday where we're going to be having another Chrissy B Show. But for now, if you want more details about the program, you can visit chrissybshow.tv. And also don't forget Facebook at Chris, the Chrissy B Show and Twitter, Chrissy B Show. So we'll see you again on Friday. Bye-bye for now.